I am delighted to be here, um, and my name is Ingrid Ellen, and I'm on the faculty of the, at the Wagner School here at NYU, and I'm also one of the faculty directors at the Furman Center at NYU. Um, I'm fascinated by this topic. I, admit I really haven't done research on, on uh, the connection between the university and the city, but I, I learned a lot from the first panel, so thank you to Richard, Jeremy, and Duke for getting this conversation started. And I have the pleasure now of sort of moderating, you know, continuing that conversation um, with a terrific group of panelists where we're really gonna dig in kind of a little deeper and get a little bit to kind of the, the how-to questions, I'd say. Um, and uh, we're joined today by Alex, uh, Alex Feldman and Val Piper and Ruben Gaitani. Um, and I'm not gonna, you have the full bios in your, in your program, so I'm not gonna go into all the detail of all the, all the um, wonderful work that you've done in the past, but let me just say a little bit that um, Alex is a vice president at U3 Advisors, which is a consulting firm that um, specializes in providing sort of real estate and, and economic development advice for anchor institutions like universities and hospitals. Um, he's done um, work in, for universities around the country and, and, and around the world, including American University of Be Beirut, the American University of Cairo, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, University of Maryland, College Park. You've done work in Detroit. Um, so anyway, you clearly have a, a lot of insights to a wonderful experience to share on this issue. Um, and then um, Val Piper, who, um, is, is currently the Vice President of Engaged Practice at the Dem Democracy Collaborative, where she oversees community wealth building projects um, and services across the country. She also brings experience from, from government, both at the local level, at the uh, Chicago Housing Authority, and also a number of years at HUD. Um, and, and finally, I think I first uh, knew of you, Val, when you were running the, um, this wonderful program at the University of Pennsylvania, which was really an innovative, um, kind of uh, graduate program in, in community development. And um, so, so she brings experience both in government and, and academia. Um, so I think it's wonderful to bring those perspectives. And finally, um, Ruben Gaitani is an assistant professor of strategic management at the University of Toronto. He's an economist uh, by training um, and is doing um, really interesting work on innovation in the tech sector on um, the uh, importance of urban density and, and the impact of both the tech center and, and the tech sector and, and universities on, on urban inequality. And so I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that as well. So, um, so let me sort of dig in first and, and start with a, really a variant of the, the first question that Richard asked, which is, um, it, it's hard for me not to start with sort of the basic question of, of what uh, your views are on the role of the university in, in economic development um, and, and urban development. And, and you know, if, if you could sort of just you know, give, be, be as concrete as possible of sort of the ways that the universities can engage with communities, should engage with communities to, to help them grow and, and develop. Sure, well thank you for having me today and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think when you think about, when we think about universities in our practice at U3 Advisors, um, we look at them as not just anchor institutions, but also as economic engines, that they are not just the, they have a mission obviously to provide education, and we also work with hospitals, so to provide healthcare. Um, but when you look and you actually dig deep into the institution, you can see all of these different departments and different services that they provide have economic impact, right? So it's where your employees and students are living and where they're spending their money. It's where your procurement dollars are going. Are they going to the neighborhood? Are they going outside of the neighborhood, outside of the city? Um, how are you hiring? Are you hiring from your neighborhood? Um, is there a direct workforce connection? And then what are you doing with your real estate? Are you land banking for 50 years and, and letting a lot of, in, in, in a lot of sort of weaker market cities, letting that land sort of sit there? Um, or are you activating that real estate with uses that actually start to engage the edges of your campus? And so for us, when we think about what role an institution can, can play in economic development, it's, it's beyond just the core mission. It's about how do you leverage those, the enterprise of the institution and actually allow it to be the economic driver of your neighborhood, of your community, and actually start to unlock the ways that you can uh, do that. So, so very quickly, I think, you know, you can, you can do things like housing incentives and attract employees in. You can connect the, the, um, the procurement um, 
to to local job, uh, lo sorry, local uh, companies. Um, you can create workforce development pipelines, but all of that has to really be embedded within the institution and within great leadership. And I think that was, I think, really, um, really uh, talked about uh, significantly on the first panel. And I, I would say that leadership is probably the most important thing to get a lot of that done. Okay, so, so you're really emphasizing just even through th sort of the the core business of the university that. They they have a, many have a huge numbers of employees. They have a lot of real estate and they have spending, right? And so all of those things that they can direct in mm -hmm. in ways that can then can support the economic development. So, and what about you, Val? Well, I would add to all of that. I mean, the Democracy Collaborative is concerned with inclusive economic growth within all of the streams that Alex just uh, Alex just described. So I think um, we just actually launched a 31 um, university. Uh, initiative with the Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities um, all across the country, um, public and private institutions, one in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. So a uh, really terrific group of organizations that are all talking about this, you know, what we would call an anchor mission, you know, really focusing their um, economic activity in terms of hiring, purchasing, uh, and investing as well as real estate. Um, so not necessarily just investing in real estate, although I think it gets a little harder when people are trying to manage their endowments in a tough time. Um, yeah, folks are really kind of unpacking all of those um, opportunities they have to make opportunity available in a more systematic way to lower income um, people um, in their mm -hmm. communities as well as geographies that may be nearby uh, and within the um, within the community uh, physically that the university occupies. And so that's a, an active conversation. Yeah. Some of these folks are involved um, you know, within their own institution and trying to double down on um, initiatives they may already have, um, you know, working um, from having students involved with local organizations to create some of those impacts to um, participating in cross-sector collaboratives in their cities um, with mm -hmm. other health and educational institutions as well as cities. and nonprofits and foundations. So there's a lot of um, lot of really robust um, collaborative work going on now. And what universities um, are in that mm -hmm. 31 member coalition? And is that voluntary? Is that it's voluntary, yes. So absolutely. Okay. And so it's a it's a network to share experiences. Okay. Um, and Got so it. Uh, and so I can certainly pass the, yeah, uh, the no, information just, around, but it's, um, it's just a really but exciting any university can join. And I'm saying it's urban and metropolitan, so uh, it's yeah, not just people downtown. Need to be, uh, yes, urban and metropolitan, you need to um, self-identify okay. um, as being urban and be a member of Kumu, okay. so, uh, or become one. So. Great. So yeah, so that's a, it's a really exciting um, now national and international conversation. And um, I think the, the thing that's really exciting for me, having worked on both the, you know, on all different sides of this equation is to see the links that many institutions are making between the work that their students can do engaging with communities and nonprofits um, all the way into these more you know sort of uh, institutional partnerships and connections and the opportunities that that creates across the spectrum of education through business. Mm -hmm. Great. And Ruben? Um, first of all, thanks for the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, so. Uh, so your question is about what is the role of universities in uh, local economic development? Mm -hmm. how, how, how does the, the, what role the university plays uh, specifically? Um, so you know, you, we can try to put it a little bit into a historical perspective. The university, the way we know it today, is something that uh, uh, at least in an environment like the United States started in the 1950s. So if we go back to the Industrial Revolution, the university was really not that important. Best universities were in Scotland in the 18th century. Manchester and Liverpool had no university, meaningful at least. Uh, second Industrial Revolution, then technical universities started popping out in, popping, um, in Germany. Uh, and you know they start transferring knowledge, train engineers, but in an environment in which economic dynamism is very low. There are still, in, still factories, you need to generate, you have to train engineers who are good at that. There is a technical school who allows you to do that. Uh, this is not a directly transferable to today's environment, neither. Uh, maybe a good uh, proxy for that would be the Rochester example. The University of Rochester and the city of Rochester was connected to a, one company. Training people were very good for, for, for that particular industry. 
but you know, the faith of that kind of model has not been very successful in Europe. Uh, so we go back to the, we fast forward to the 1950s, uh, something happens. Um, there is the standardization of the admission procedures. So universities, instead of having very idiosyncratic ways of selecting people through like specific interviews, uh, specific tests, uh, they standardize their admission procedures. What this implies is that students now want to apply very broadly and do a very broad search to try to look for their best match in terms of college. Now, what this implies is that they apply broadly, they start to move. Uh, you decide to move in the city or in the metro area that offers the best match in terms of uh, the university, the college, the higher education that you can get. Now, this uh, mobility is one of the most important factors through which, the most important channels through which university can affect local economic development. In other words, you attract the best students or the students with which you have the best match in but terms of what stay? the university, that's the other question. Right? I mean. Now, the, 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 the big step in everyone's life is moving out for college. Yeah. Uh, again, before the 1950s, this was not the case. People were mm -hmm. staying within a 10 miles radius from their place, which you know, at the time maybe was relevant dif uh, distance, but uh, yeah, so you move, eventually you stick around. You stay there for your career and to set up a family. Uh, this, of course, generated a big increase in the competition among universities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so that's the first thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the ability to attract uh, talented people uh, within the metro I want to come back to that because I want yeah. to come back to sort of the retaining them, which I think is the, the trickier part. A absolutely, yes, that's, that's absolutely the first one. Well, now, nowadays things have changed. There is an additional component, which is the relationship between the university and the industry. Mm -hmm. I think the most successful example here is the Stanford Research Park and the Silicon Valley example, yeah. uh, which is very different from the Rochester example, and uh, you know, a, a little bit with the benefit of hindsight, it was more, uh, more successful. So it would be yeah. interesting to understand why that kind of model was more successful than the Rochester one. Right, but it um, certainly was, was reaching out to a more diverse set. It was an, wasn't a single company. And that's absolutely yeah. one of the factors that yeah. we're gonna have to so, look into. So can I ask you, um, Val and Alex, I mean now, we heard a lot about the you know, incredible example of Drexel in Arizona State, and you know, and and uh, certainly Stanford is an example that a lot of people hold out. But are there are there other um, examples that you would hold out of of university community partnerships that you think have been particularly <laughs> successful, and and um, or ones that you think are really promising going forward? Well, we're certainly following a lot of those. Um, a a non-Philadelphia example, although right. Philadelphia is really <laughs> no. close to my heart, no. uh, <clears throat> would be the Newark 2020. Um, initiative to uh, hire 2020 uh, unemployed Newark residents by 2020, um, which is a collaborative of anchors including Rutgers Camden. Rutgers, okay. Or I'm sorry, Rutgers, Rutgers Newark. Rutgers, right. Rutgers <laughs> Newark, right. I'm still in Philly <laughs> in my head, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in promise own land. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, so to, uh, to, to hire local, buy yeah. local, uh, and, and redevelop real estate. It's a very, you know, sort of aggressive campaign in conjunction with um, local anchors, including RWJ Barnabas and other, mm -hmm. you know, local anchor institutions, Prudential, um, mm -hmm. to work with the city to produce those, those outcomes. And I think um, one of the things that I'm sure everyone would point to in these sorts of situations is that it's generally not, um, you know, if we're really gonna get to sort of um, true inclusive work, um, in lower income communities, it often exceeds the capacity of the university to do that by itself. Right. Right, I mean, you can spot right. what kind of jobs you have a hard time hiring for, or retaining people mm -hmm. for, you can quantify the turnover costs mm -hmm. um, and figure out what it's worth to you to do a better you know, job of filling and keeping those people. Um, but the skill set and the ability to penetrate the neighborhood networks to you know, sort of find and support the right folks to take those jobs, to help people advance within the institution once they get there. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is usually the specialty of nonprofits, sometimes neighborhood-based, sometimes more citywide. Mm -hmm. And the funding sources for those sorts of activities are often uh, philanthropic or government. And so having like a real coordinated partnership that has a um, clear set of goals attached to it and a clear set of um, 
outcomes that everybody's really sort of tracking toward and driving toward um, mm -hmm. is incredibly important in each of these situations to be long-term successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but obviously the partnerships are key, yeah. and this is sort of, and I think in the first panel didn't talk as much about sort of partnership with community-based organizations, mm -hmm. which might be particularly important as well. So. Correct. I was actually just going to bring yeah. that up because I think um, the the role of third-party inter intermediaries, the, th the role of those organizations, is becoming so important um, for this work to happen. Um, you can look at examples like the University City District in Philadelphia. Um, University Circle in Cleveland, uh, in Detroit, where we worked very closely, Midtown Detroit, Inc., uh, which functions, um, I think, uh, in a neighborhood with many anchor institutions, but also receives funding from those anchor institutions and philanthropy. Uh, we've been working in Memphis, Tennessee right now on uh, an organ with a new, to start a new organization called the Memphis Medical District Collaborative, which brings together eight uh, anchor institutions all around healthcare to, um, to revitalize their community. And those organizations, I mean, there are, there are certainly CDCs that exist that, um, you know, that receive government funding, um, but I think the, the role of an organization that receives direct funding from an institution and then can do the work of, uh, sort of on behalf of the institution, outside of the walls of the institution, but in partnership with the institution, where the members, the CEOs, or the, the leadership is on the board, right next to the members of the community, that is such an important role, and those organizations are becoming crucial, I think, to getting this work done. Mm -hmm. So can I, can I actually sort of follow up with both of you, and then Ruben, I'm gonna come back to you in a second with, the, with sort of the more macro question, but, but how can universities kind of best engage with communities. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, you know, right, federal government, local, a lot of government actors find that daunting, universities find it daunting. So what are the best ways to, to form those partnerships and to genuinely engage with your local communities, which I think um, Jeremy talked about that, the back door. Um, well, there are certainly many ways, right, through research, through if the education. If one way, I want to hear it. Yeah, I well, know, I, know. I mean, <laughs> I, the way that we often try to sell the idea of working, especially with institutions that aren't as familiar with this type of work or don't necessarily see the value, is to find what we like to call the enlightened self-interest of an institution, right? So where does it benefit from being part of a community dialogue? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's not necessarily the most sort of um, I mean, you want the institution to sort of believe that it's, you know, this is, they're doing this for, for all the right reasons, but at the end of the day, they need to benefit too. Um, and that's not a bad thing, right? These institutions are important economic drivers for the community, but you start to think about, um, they're attracting talent, they're attracting faculty and staff and students to their campus. Um, I think Richard talked about uh, coming to, to or, or Duke talked about coming to Tempe and saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, no one on Central Avenue, that, you know, to have a vibrant neighborhood, an engaged neighborhood around them is, is important to attract and retain those, that staff. Um, if the neighborhood around them is failing, I mean, as it was in the 1990s for the University of Pennsylvania when Judith Roden was president, that institution is, has the risk of failing as well. And it's, its future is tied to the future of that, of that neighborhood. And I think having the, the connections, so, so it's really about finding the, the intersections, the points where the institution can see the value. Well, that can sort of motivate the university, right? But then Val sort of, uh, let me push you on mm -hmm. sort of, but, but how do you actually, how can universities most effectively do this in a genuine way, right? So I actually am gonna give you an answer that's from sort of more experience than the Democracy Collaborative, yeah. so, because I've, all, I've often been a person in a situation, I might have been, had, a, had a seat in government or a seat with a nonprofit or a seat with a university, but um, I've often seen my role as being the success of the collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to have a successful collaboration, you need to not only understand the interests of the institution, um, as Alex rightly pointed out, you have to have an understanding of the interests of all of the other folks at the table. Yep. And what the timing of those interests are. So if you're working with government, there's a certain cycle to when tangible results need to be shown in order for um, continued dedication even of staff time. And you know, that's also true in an organization like an you know, a, mm -hmm. a university where you don't have a huge amount of extra staff, even though it looks like you know, a very robust institution. 
um, for community-based organizations and leaders, there's a huge amount of reputational risk um, in getting involved with a big institution like a university that has historically been seen potentially as um, an interloper, right? So you have to really unpack what about this is gonna be different and what those people need to be able to demonstrate to the uh, local networks and constituents that you want to engage mm -hmm. and what really matters. Right, so, and, and sometimes it's not what you think would matter, right? There might not be an immediate alignment of interests, but if you can address the thing that's really bothering people, you know, that's, you know, we blocked off a, you know, part of a road because um, this is a example I remember from one of the early public housing redevelopments that I was involved with a uh, long time ago, you know, Georgia Tech had blocked off a road and it cost everybody because they didn't wanna have folks driving through from the neighboring public housing. And so it cost everybody an extra couple of dollars when they took a cab home. You know, the ambulance couldn't get through. There, you know, removing the barrier opened up the conversation, mm -hmm. right? And the university had, was just sort of, you know, articulating where its perimeter was and where mm -hmm. its, you know, security was. But that was the first thing that had to happen. And if that didn't happen, no conversation happened. Mm -hmm. And there is now a, you know, much more thriving, you know, um, neighborhood and school integration in that area than there, than there was. And so I feel like in a very invisible way, mm -hmm. really getting out there and um, having the real conversations about where to start is incredibly important and um, building early trust yeah. in, a, in a safe way. Right. Um, and and that, so that's not a cookie cutter answer at all. No, but, um, it but, it, like it, but you have to dedicate the right exactly. kind of staff, and you've got to make an investment. That this is not yeah. just we're gonna we're gonna go in in the next six months. We're gonna right. fix our community relations. People yeah. have seen a ton of that. Yeah, right. And so you don't yeah. you don't want to be that, right? So, but I think it also the right person has to be doing it. So, yeah. um, if an institution is serious, it should yeah. be someone with does, the ear of the CEO right. who is charged to just go out and really listen. But it also sounds yeah. like, I mean, you know, building again on the first panel, that this can't just be about one university president that happens to be committed. This has to be something that you institutionalize right. because it has to be seen as something that's long term. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and getting to scale, you right. know, quickly means setting up those sorts of intermediaries yeah. and other kinds of situations that can actually deliver on the longer term agenda yeah. once you're able to suss out what it is and get everybody around the table. Okay. The other quick point about this is that once you've got a sense of, you know, what those interests really are early on. I think sort of convening people in the right kind of table mm -hmm. and governance structure so that folks don't feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, or you know, the, mm -hmm. there's a process that doesn't really fit, I think is really important. Um, did you want to jump in quickly? Oh, very quickly, okay. just I think building on that, the role of philanthropy I think is also crucial. Crucial. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in Detroit, for example, our work started there in 2009, and it was the height of the Great Recession. Detroit was, uh, you know, a poster child for everything that could have gone wrong, and um, it looked at its assets, what was what was still there, and its institutions were, you know, those were the the one of the things that they wanted to focus on. And convening that conversation was the Kresge Foundation and the Hudson Weber Foundation. And without them bringing the leadership of the institutions to the table, this that conversation wouldn't have, would never have happened. And I think um, philanthropy continues to be an important driver of how institutions engage and what roles they should play. Yeah, I mean, I think that is really important. It, it's a, sort of deeply troubling. I mean, I think, Jeremy, what did you say? How many Pittsburgh foundations? Was it Pittsburgh that there's five foundations? So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, Baltimore has a bunch of foundations. You know, New York has a lot of foundations. I mean, but there's cities out there that don't have the benefit of having, or they might have one really small community foundation. So, you know, it does raise these sort of capacity issues about yeah. how do you do this work around the country. But, um, but Ruben, I wanted to take a step back or sort of go into sort of a more macro perspective because you um, recently uh, wrote a working paper about the relationships between universities and social inequality. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, a little bit maybe of the kind of darker side of, at a more macro level of what, yeah. of, you know, what universities might be contributing <coughs> to and, and, and then how can they minimize that? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for this question. You know, for, for a researcher talking about, my own research is always great, <laughs> uh, but it's unusual to be in a panel where you can, at least you have the hope or the feeling that this can have a real world impact. So, 
Uh, I was initially was interested in understanding why uh, income segregation went up w w can, on aggregate, on average, in the United States yeah. over the last 30 years. And uh, uh, this is something that Richard had already noticed in some of his work with Charlotte and Lander. Uh, it looks like income segregation is connected to, this, to the tech sector. Uh, tech sector uh, meaning innovative activities, activities uh, or industries that rely heavily on uh, high, ta high talented uh, workers, highly educated workers. Um, uh, what I did in a previous work was looking more into the econometrics of that and we could actually make some conclusions that were not just about correlations but was actually about causality, meaning an increase or an expansion in knowledge intensive activities tend actually to lead to more pronounced segregation. And why is that? At a metropolitan? In a metropolitan we area. How do okay. we define segregation actually? That's yeah. a good point. Segregation is just a measure of economic disparities across different neighborhoods mm -hmm. within a metropolitan area. That's how we define it. Uh, and we see that it goes up in a, you know, in a way that uh, economically speaking we can uh, call causal, meaning you have an expansion of innovative activities, you have an increase in economic segregation. So why does this happen and how this applies to universities? So it happens for two reasons. Uh, new tech companies come to town. Uh, these tech companies use a peculiar input in their production, uh, which is ideas, knowledge. Uh, this is a peculiar input because it cannot be purchased by a wholesale trader. You have to access it some other ways. How do you do it? By co-locating, by locating in close proximity to other firms or other institutions or other organizations from which you can access this knowledge and these ideas. So you form these tech clusters within the metro area and you see that uh, high salary workers, high, you know, high, uh, highly educated workers tend to move in the neighborhoods surrounding these tech clusters essentially because they want to reduce their commuting time uh, between their place of residence and their place of work. Uh, this is the first thing. It's kind of the initial push, which is important, but it's not the bigger part. Because the bigger part comes from the fact that uh, as these high salary workers relocate close to these new employment opportunities, they increase the demand for some types of residential services, mm -hmm. such as schools, better schools, but that's the critical one. Uh, there are also there are others that are more frivolous, like yoga studios, coffee shops, and so, so they are frivolous, but they are actually quite powerful in driving up the rental price of housing to the point in which lower income households are induced to relocate. The endogenous the amenities. These endogenous yeah. amenities yeah. channel, which is actually yeah. the most powerful one. Yeah. Even if it's not the direct one, it's actually the most powerful. We estimate it's about two thirds of the overall impact. Mm -hmm. uh, why are universities important in this, in con in this context? First of all, they determine which metro areas will have this expansion in knowledge intensive activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, in a recent paper with Richard, we actually see this quite clearly. Uh, uh, they attract, you know, you, you, you observe very strong correlations with patenting activity, with mm -hmm. venture capital investment. Uh, uh, and, you know, there are also ways, measures that we suggest also in this paper to uh, how to quantitatively assess, how to quant quantitatively measure the effect of the universities on local non academic innovation. Mm -hmm. by looking at citations from, uh, pat from academic papers to patents. So that's the, that's the first thing. So you determine which cities will have this inflow of knowledge intensive activities. The second part is within the city, within the metro area, the universities determines which neighborhoods will be eventually uh, turned into innovation clusters. Uh, and we see it very clearly with recent data, uh, these very strong concentration of both venture capital investment, so startup, innovative startups, and relocation of uh, uh, workers in the creative class or in the you know in knowledge intensive occupations that tend to cluster around major academic institutions, um, and and these for the channels that I had described mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. will drive up the income segregation. So, so let me ask you something. I mean. Uh, uh, the, my reading of, of some of this research, right, is that you have these sort of economic shocks at the sort of high skill, the increases in high skill demand in cities. And generally, that has, on the one hand, some positive labor market spillovers for lower wage workers, less skilled workers. At the same time, it increases housing prices, right? So it's sort of, so, I mean, is that the way you're seeing it? Sort of there, there, there's, a, there's a plus 
but there's also this minus and we have to figure out a way to, to basically, I mean, to me, it's, you yeah. know, to some extent, it's a, there, this positive story on the labor market side, but we have to figure out a way to lock in um, some affordability on, yes. the, on the housing side. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one important thing to notice here is that we don't observe a change in the composition of the labor force. And the reason is that if, uh, if, educate, if highly educated workers come to town, uh, you need service, service workers. So the composition, right. the, the, sh the relative shares don't change. But what changes dramatically is the share of the value added that is produced by the kind of the skill premium, the education premium. Mm -hmm. So the difference in the salary it increases mm -hmm. a lot. House prices increases, increase a lot as yeah. well, but also, and more importantly, the kind of the, the divergence, uh, the, 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 the variance in house yeah. prices. Right. Uh, and the reason is that you have relatively good neighborhoods in which that now become poor because, yeah. you know, because high earning people actually move out and they become poor also because low, earn, low, uh, low income households move yeah, in. Um, so you have this divergence. Um, is it, uh, well, uh, it's positive, yes. Yeah. So that, that's definitely something you have to keep in mind. We can't, we can't use this segregation or inequality kind right. of story to make an argument so, of the form so we should prevent this right. from happening. Absolutely right. not. Right, exactly. So we're not so going to say, right, we're not going to end this panel by saying, okay, the, the implication is no more universities. That's right? absolutely no universities the wrong. Right? <laughs> That's absolutely so the, the wrong question conclusion. is, right, is so, so let me turn back to sort of concretely, and, and let's start with sort of the workforce side, right? Let's say sort of what can, I mean, universities are training people, right? We're, we're, we're educating people. Um, and so are we, we'd like to think that we are, right? That's our mission. And so, so are there ways that universities can do more to, to reach out into communities, to open up their doors and, and um, really help on workforce development and try to, try to well, I don't know what to say, shrink the gap, raise the bottom? Um, Absolutely. And I think, you know, really fascinating research. And I, th I, I think, you know, tying that research concretely to sort of an example, of um, how an institution can play a role in making a place more equitable, more affordable. Um, in Detroit, um, we, we worked together with those foundations and Wayne State University and Henry Ford Hospital and Detroit Medical Center uh, to create a number of programs, one of which was called Live Midtown. And um, Live Midtown was born out of the idea that only 5% of the employees of the institution lived in Midtown Detroit. Um, 30,000 of, thir of, Wayne, of State. Wayne State, Henry Ford, of all three institutions, we, we actually collected a lot of data, and data is so important to sort of showing institutional leaders, you know, what really needs to be done, but um, we, we said, we, we, were, we, able, we were able to demonstrate that, you know, on average, people were driving 10, 12, 15 miles a day to come in and out of work, and um, only 5% of the employees lived in the neighborhood, so we said, you know, what we, and the market, the housing market at the time was suffering, so we said, yeah. let's, let's actually try to jumpstart it. There was a lot of supply in the market, so we offered up to $20,000 in, um, forgivable loans to buy a house in the neighborhood. We offered up to $2,000 to rent in the neighborhood. It was actually rental incentives were never really considered alongside with that. So it was a sort of an experiment and it was hugely successful. Over almost 2,000 people participated in the program and I think 70% are still staying in Midtown after that. Um, it's made the neighborhood more desirable. It's made housing prices go up um, so much now that the conversations actually shifted uh, to the point where Midtown Detroit Inc., which started the, which, you know, launched the program and, and, and administered it is actually launched a program called Stay Midtown. And it's using the same funders, but it's actually targeting workforce um, in the neighborhood. Not necessarily, you don't have, have to have anything to do with uh, the institutions, but it's, it's actually rental assistance. And you have to, I think, earn, you know, up to 30% of the area mean income to participate in it. But it's, uh, they've had almost 200 people uh, participate in the program. It's only about a year old. Um, and I think, when we start to think about incentives and institutions doing that, maybe we need to start to couple those types of work together so you can jumpstart a market in, in the case of a weaker market, but also make sure that it doesn't remain, it doesn't get, you know, get, go too quickly. Right, exactly. Yeah. One of my, someone sent me a t-shirt that says, don't Brooklyn my Detroit. <laughs> so there are, I know there, there is certainly, there are concerns about gentrification in Detroit now, I know, but it's certainly, but certainly it's a different market context, I yeah. think. If, if we started yeah. a campaign to, you know, get more faculty to live in, in the village, I don't think that would be so popular here at uh, NYU. But, but anyway, but can we talk about that sort of workforce a little bit and sort of, Val, do you have a sense of that, of, of ways universities, I mean, you know, I think there's some wonderful examples of community college partnerships mm -hmm. with that, um, but what about 
it's not yeah, a I mean, I feel space. like there, um, much of it is in yeah. the community college space, but um, you know, in terms of uh, technical training for mm -hmm. uh, for jobs in, in anchors that we see mm -hmm. across the country, uh, often in these cross sector partnerships, you'll have a community college that's like talking to the hospital and the university about like certified mm -hmm. types of positions and and moving people people into those. Um, you know, I do think the land conversation is very important and baking uh, yeah. a sensible um, triggers, you know, you know, mechanisms in to retain affordability in a mixed and increasingly mixed income context. Now, Jeremy's mm -hmm. done a tremendous amount of work on this in prior lives as well as your current <coughs> role mm -hmm. uh, in terms of coming up with like the, uh, some of the, the most sophisticated ways of sort of doing that analysis, but it, it really is crucial to have the right kinds of partners, again, to you know, sort of own and hold land. If you're thinking about community land trusts as ownership mm -hmm. vehicles for lower income people or um, you know, limited equity co-ops, which you know, have a long history of you know, uh, mm -hmm. both uh, uh, good and difficult, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, work in the housing world, um, being able to really um, do that well Mm -hmm. um, and kind of support those kinds of organizations that are, you know, creating shared ownership vehicles so people can really participate in the um, uh, appreciation that's happening as a result of these strategies mm -hmm. um, is, uh, it's sort of critical to think about that at the front end mm -hmm. um, and kind of get it into the bloodstream. And, you know, so, um, one of the things, this is sort of a, an employee assisted housing program that's uh, with a twist, a little bit different uh, in the uh, context of the Evergreen Co-ops in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, we found was that people were getting good jobs with uh, worker owner benefits, um, working for the um, greenhouse that supplies lettuce to all of the anchor institutions in uh, the university circle or the um, the solar installation panels and you know that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and people were getting these good jobs and then moving out of the neighborhood, right? Because mm -hmm. well, what do you do when you, you, know, you move to a place where the, your house is gonna be worth something more and you're gonna mm -hmm. um, move up, right? So that kind of went against the um, community uh, reinvestment uh, um, uh, goal of the whole thing. And so there's now a program by which um, the cooperative actually um, will pay the mortgage out of the wages so that it's a more of a guaranteed uh, type of funding stream for mm -hmm. uh, workers who are still, you know, fairly low income but much more stabilized, mm -hmm. and you know that's just another way of kind of making sure that people have access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just coming back to real estate very quickly, because I think that's a fundamental issue in this, is that um, student housing is actually a huge mm -hmm. factor in affordability, huge. and actually we no, yeah. no people don't talk about that a lot with institutions um, as a way that it's causing gentrification or, or housing prices to soar. I mean, if you think about what's, what, what's one of the most profitable sectors, it's, it's like owning a dilapidated house in a neighborhood next to a university and, and renting out rooms to like 10 or 12 students in that house and making a ton of money and sitting on it for 50 years. Yeah. Um, that drives up housing prices in, in neighborhoods around institutions. So when an institution thinks about those issues, it also has to think about the land it owns and what it's actually doing around housing policy and and, and also um, how institutions want to um, you know either attract students to live in housing right at the edge of the campus or all those things contribute to right. to a qual equity right, right. in the equity conversation. So it's when an institution ignores it, that's when a lot of the problems start so to really... So when you say university folks that, that should be thinking about housing policy, do you yeah. mean like city housing policy or do you uh, mean its own... I think its own housing policy, policy to start with, but I mean there's, yeah. I think... You can, I was going to say, I think yeah. you find allies yeah. pretty quickly uh, at the city, but it's, yeah. Well, and sort of the value of master leasing is another thing right. people don't like to talk about, but yeah. um, can actually be really impactful when yeah. you're doing sort of mixed use or mixed income kinds of projects. Yeah. Um, uh, right, and that's something the universities, or a lot of universities do control, right? right. They exactly. Have, they, they do exactly. have land. Yeah. I just wanted to add in that. Uh, we, uh, so universities have to kind of take responsibility also for what happens uh, beyond the boundaries uh, of mm -hmm. the campus. I was curious to, you, you, can, you can do it, you just Google any uni major university in a post-industrial city, mm -hmm. and you can uh, uh, Google the following question, is the campus of, name of the university safe, question mark, and you will find mm -hmm. Quora and you go Yahoo answer, these kind of things, and uh, you get some very kind of uh, entertaining uh, answers. Uh, the most entertaining one was, uh, campus is safe, it is continuously patrolled, 
do not cross the river. Uh, so <laughs> it's clear that the university is safe, it's continuously patrolled, uh, and, you know, and, uh, but there is, there, there, is, there is no way a campus of this form can uh, uh, attract any uh, innovative company uh, to locate in the surrounding areas, yeah. retain talented workers, they would just move yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that's, right. that's, and that's, also that, that's building, important. Building walls, literally, between the university and the community. So can I just have, yes. we, we're gonna go to questions, but can I just do one sort of quick lightning round and just sort of say, so that's an example, I don't wanna start, stop on something negative, but let me just say, that was an example of sort of what a university shouldn't do. So is there, you know, something just sort of, uh, something that if there's one piece of advice you would sort of give a university to help, which, you know, universities are not always viewed as, as the best neighbor, so. What's, what's one thing that you'd want a university to take away? Um, so two things, actually, very quickly. Mm -hmm. The first is leadership at the top, and then mm -hmm. having that, um, that, that sort of big idea disseminate down into the bureaucracy, because institutions are, yeah. like cities or government, they're, they're maybe even worse. <laughs> they're, they're bureaucratic at, its, at their nature. Um, and I think the second thing is to, to start small and to try to test um, mm -hmm. opportunities. And one example from Drexel, which uh, Jeremy, I'm sure you could talk about more than I can, is um, uh, the Dornsife Center, uh, which is a phenomenal, um, it's, it's, a, it's a center in the neighborhood that sort of embodies Drexel, and mm -hmm. it's a place that community members feel comfortable going to because it's not necessarily on campus, right. but it's next to campus. Right. And at that center, Drexel plugs in, and they have their law school plugging into programs there, they have their health care uh, organizations plugging in, there, so the neighborhood can can kind of do outreach and connect with the institution, but not in a way that it's it's so overwhelmingly you know necessary to get onto campus and actually you know and go into that big bureaucracy. So start small and start to I think um, you know work work that way. That's great, mm -hmm. Val. Well, I, th I love that example because it's such a physical yeah. um, representation of the start with the invisible conversation, mm -hmm. you know, kind of kind of piece. And I and I do just want to um, you know. Uh, echo what Alex was saying about involving not just the CEO's office, not just mm -hmm. the president, but um, people who are problem solvers throughout the institution. Um, we also do a great deal of work with um, uh, multi-anchor collaboratives locally. And uh, a, you know, there are a lot of answers in the room when you pull all the procurement people together about what they can, you know, what is it they're buying? What are they having trouble sourcing? Um, do they really, um, want to have more local supplier diversity in their stream? Usually the answer is yes, but here are the barriers and they're the same barriers. And it's hard for any one institution um, to devote the resources to get around some of that stuff, but when they all start elevating the same thing, they can find common cause, even if they're competitive institutions sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's very, um, it's just, you know, it makes a whole lot of sense um, to find those, um, People in the institutions that are struggling with similar things have them develop relationships, which is often sort of not a natural act across you know, the various stovepipes, even within the university, much less between institutions. And most of those answers are really in the room. You know, or there's a very clear place where an external partner who's not you know, a university or a medical center could actually plug in and say, oh yeah, we could do that for you. <laughs> You know, and then it, it, you start to see much better results. Um, you know, you can start to pilot things. So I feel like that effort, which is somewhat intensive, um, to just kind of structure conversations over a period of time, um, can really unlock the collective potential of um, the people on both the administrative and the, um, uh, the faculty side of the institution in some really exciting ways. Well, uh, one positive. There is a um, the, the, there is not much. We, we don't know much about this. This is something that uh, we 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 um, speculate. We, we have to speculate on, and uh, instead of speculating, I think we have to experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, continuous experimentation that has to start with uh, the deliberate decision on the side of universities to actually tackle these uh, uh, mm -hmm. these kind of issues and not and not ignoring them. Yeah, um, and yeah. then you'll be there to research them, right? To That'll evaluate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. So, we have time for a few questions from the audience.
seen examples where the argument that building student housing uh, helps affordability in the neighborhood, where that argument has uh, been convincing, or do you think that uh, building dorms is generally seen by the community as a negative impact? So the question is, is building a dormitory a positive for the neighborhood or a negative for the neighborhood, or, is, or the perception of it? Um, I, th I mean, we've seen both. I, I think, um, as an example, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I, I, I went there um, right around the time this was happening as an, as an undergrad, and um, students were living off campus in, in like those sort of student rooming houses I mentioned, and it, uh, it actually drove up the cost of the neighborhood, but it also sort of blighted the neighborhood. So Penn took the, uh, the initiative to take some of their off-campus land and turn that into mixed-use development. A lot of that was uh, uh, ground leasing with developers to create student housing, um, and that actually was a positive because at the same time, Penn layered incentives for employees to move into the neighborhood and sort of the neighborhood transition from a, a sort of a student ghetto, for lack of a better terms, to something that was a lot more um, integrated and equitable with uh, institutional employees living right at the edge of the campus. Um, so I think if it's done well, it can be a positive, but there are certainly ways that it that, that it's a negative as well, uh, that it could be a negative for the community. I, th I think it depends, I mean, it can be everything from design, sort of how does that, how does that dorm actually physically integrate with the neighborhood, uh, to where it's placed, to parking requirements, things like that, all of the, if you can, if, if, the, if the university takes sort of an intentional approach to how it's, how it's well integrated and how, uh, I think it can be a positive for the community. But also, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with universities, I think, around this, it, bringing community into the conversation early on is also important, and understanding what their priorities are. So all those things need to be done to kind of make it a success. Hi, thank you. When I went to school, um, I actually went to Cornell in upstate New York. Could be because it's a land-grant university. But as a student, I was involved with the community. So I did some volunteer work. Mm -hmm. I had classes where a part of our applied work was going into uh, the community. Do you think there is a responsibility or an opportunity for students to lead this, or is there a difference to who leads proper the university? Well, I think there's an immense amount of opportunity for students to get involved in these sorts of things. I mean, I think what we're talking about are institutional engagements and long-term commitments. Um, but often students are, you know, students are the market, right? So students are often the ones who create the environment in which certain decisions are taken. Um, and, uh, and so would never, you know, I think the, the power of that is not to be underestimated. Um, I also think that as these institutional opportunities and um, partnerships are created, they create opportunities for students to get involved in different ways. And sometimes, you know, more substantial um, ways. I, you know, I can imagine, for example, if a university was starting to get interested in impact investing and had a program at its mm -hmm. uh, MBA school or, or public policy school that was about that, it would be a really cool opportunity for those students to start um, doing some of the um, research and analysis around, you know, how a neighborhood-based impact investing program might work. Just. To you know, um, or you know, the planning students, as in you know, Penn, Penn Design did a great deal of work in West Philadelphia. Um, so there were always you know these kind of community engagement opportunities that were part, and also I want to say in the uh, certainly see a ton of that type of work in K through 12 outreach, um, as was mentioned on the earlier panel, and um, you know we see that across the country in these 31 institutions we're talking about. So they're they're just sort of all over the map opportunities for for students to get out there. And I think um, it's a more durable, substantive opportunity if the institution is engaging in a longer term set of ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I would also say though, I mean, it, I guess I'm just agreeing with what you've just said, Val. I mean, oh, I, mean I think it's wonderful for students to, to get involved, but I also think it, it's incumbent upon the, the institution to be offering classes and opportunities mm -hmm. for students to engage. Now, I mean, I teach at the you know, the Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. I mean, this is core to our mission that all of our students are working with, um, they, you know, they finish there, instead of writing a thesis, they engage in a capstone project where they work with, um, with local organizations to help them solve a problem. And, um, and it's a wonderful transition for them to the real world. I think increasingly we're seeing demand from, from undergrads also mm -hmm. who, who want to 
work and um, have the opportunity to take more practical classes that 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 take them out into the real world. So mm -hmm. I think it's something that um, you know part of maybe rebuilding the broken model. So 